Hey, welcome back, wonderful students. Now we're going to talk about assessment and management of patients with diabetes. Here are the learning objectives for this chapter. Please take a moment to review each one of these. Diabetes continues to be a growing problem here in the United States as well as worldwide. Many attribute it here in the U.S. specifically to our diet and lack of exercise. Diabetes is also more prevalent in minority populations. There are many other factors that put people at risk for diabetes. These include family history of the disease, obesity, if you are African American, Native American, Asian, Pacific Islander, and or Hispanic. Diabetes chances increase as you age beyond the age of 45 years. And also if you have hypertension, and if you have a low HDL or a high triglyceride level, that also puts you at a higher risk. Or if you've had a history of gestational diabetes or have had a baby, this is females of course, um, over nine pounds at birth. All of those are factors that put you at a higher risk. There are several different types of diabetes. We will go into detail on specifically type one and type two for block one. And then uh, beginning in block two, three, and four, you're gonna discuss many other types. Gestational diabetes occurs when a woman is pregnant due to the secretion of hormones in the placenta, which causes insulin resistance. Women should be tested sometime during the 24 to 28 week of gestation and sooner if they are at a higher risk for developing gestational diabetes. All of these types are outlined in your book. Pause and take a moment to review them. Let's review the role of insulin in the body. Insulin is needed to help move glucose from the bloodstream into the cells for energy. Insulin binds to the receptors on cell membranes and changes the membrane permeability to allow the glucose to enter. Think of insulin as the code or password to access your cell phone. If insulin is not available, the glucose stays in your bloodstream and can't be transported into the cells. Then the body turns to breaking down fat and proteins for energy. When fat break down, breaks down, it becomes fatty acids. Those fatty acids are called ketones and they will collect in the blood and eventually spill over into the urine. When the body, um, I'm sorry, when the blood sugar falls, the insulin production will stop because your body is sensing it doesn't need it. That's when counter regulatory hormones like uh, respond like glucagon. Glucagon causes the release of glucose that is stored in the liver all in an attempt to regulate blood sugar. Constant lack of insulin or the inability of the insulin to bind to the receptor cells will create a state of hyperglycemia or high blood sugar. The functions of insulin are listed on this slide. Please pause the video, take a moment and make flashcards for them. Remember, we cannot live without insulin. So if somebody has type one diabetes where their body is no longer producing insulin, then they have to be given artificial insulin the remainder of their life. Let's review type one diabetes mellitus. Type one used to be called juvenile diabetes because most people were diagnosed with this at a younger age. This can be screened by testing for the antigen HLA slash DR or HLA slash DQ. There is no insulin production in type one because the beta cells in the pancreas are destroyed by the immune system in an autoimmune process. Type two diabetes mellitus is not an autoimmune disease. It is sometimes called adult onset diabetes. Since this is a slow progression onset, type two diabetes can go undetected for many years. For most people diagnosed with diabetes, it is detected accidentally through having other blood work drawn or upon going to their ophthalmologist uh, to do their eye examinations. Many people who are diagnosed with type two diabetes start treatment using using an oral hypoglycemic medication. And we are gonna talk about that here in a bit. 
This slide reviews the organs and systems that are involved in contributing to high blood sugar in type 2 diabetes. As you can see, it involves more than just poor uptake or production of insulin. Here is the latent autoimmune diabetes of adults broken down on this slide. Again, this is just a review um, on the latent autoimmune diabetes um, condition, and uh, we're not going to really test on this in block one, but you will need to carry this information forward in block two, three, and four. What places you at risk for diabetes? Type 1 diabetes is due to genetics. This can be screened by testing for the antigens HLA-DR or HLA-DQ. It can also be due to possible immunological or environmental factors. The exact cause is unknown, but the thought process is, is that uh, there is definitely a pre-genetic disposition. So if type 1 runs in families, then there is a genetic component and puts that family at a higher risk. They know that it also possibly has to do with the immune systems of the patients that are that get it, um, stress, environmental factors, and, uh, and viral factors as well. 60-80% of patients diagnosed with type 2 diabetes are in the obese category. Hereditary factors play a major role as well. If one or more of your parents are diagnosed with diabetes, you have a 15% higher chance of developing it. Metabolic syndrome or syndrome X, as it is sometimes called, is when you have all of the following, excuse me, I had the hiccups. You have all of the following factors present at the same time, and thus it increases your risk for developing diabetes dramatically. These include being diagnosed with these or currently being treated for these factors. And they include abdominal obesity, hyperglycemia, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, or a triglyceride level over 250. Other contributing factors include, uh, type, for type 2, would include advanced age. So it starts with anybody over the age of 30. And the older you get, uh, that increases your percentage of getting type 2 diabetes. Um, your, again, high density lipoprotein or HDL is less than or equal to 35 milligrams per deciliter. Or the triglyceride level is over 250 milligrams per deciliter. Um, you are at a higher risk of getting gestational diabetes in the future if you've ever had it before, or if you've delivered a baby over nine pounds. If you have hypertension, if you have a family history of diabetes, for example, your parents or siblings with diabetes. If you're obese, you have a 20%, uh, sorry, if you're obese and you're 20% or more overweight, um, then that puts you at a much, much higher risk. Previously identified that you have impaired fasting glucose or what we call an impaired glucose tolerance. So meaning your body can't tolerate um, excessive glucose or you are your race or ethnicity is African-American, Hispanic American, Native American, Asian American or Pacific Islanders. Patients will present with signs and symptoms of polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. If you don't know what these are, pause and look them up in your book or Lippincott Advisor. Other symptoms include fatigue, weakness, sudden vision changes, tingling or numbness in your hands and feet, dry skin, skin lesions that, are, that won't heal or are difficult to heal, um, or reoccurrent infections. Sudden weight loss or nausea, vomiting, or abdominal pains. Those three things may be signs for type 1 diabetes. Okay, so here's type 1 diabetes again. And symptoms include um, excessive thirst, excessive hunger, unexplained weight loss. That's usually the number one thing that will take them into the doctor's office is 
Again, remember it's in teenage years, typically, not always, but typically, um, you will have your kids losing weight and they should never lose weight just because, right? They end up being severely fatigued, so they have no energy, which again is not normal for kids. And so you end up taking them in and, and it's because their body's not producing um, insulin, right? And in order to use our uh, glucose for energy, we have to have insulin. It's like a lock and key. The insulin unlocks the ability of the body to use the glucose for energy right so we have to be able to have that um they get blurred vision because the blood vessels behind the eyes are real small and and the um high sh glucose in the blood will really kill those blood vessels quickly and so their their uh, vision changes right that's usually what takes them in too um and frequent urination obviously right so with if it's babies that come down with it because they do right type one they will be they'll have a ton of wet diapers right way more than what they should um okay the diagnosis of diabetes occurs when the patient has a fasting glucose level over 126 milligrams per deciliter or a random glucose of over 200 or a two-hour post load glucose of 200 or more during an oral glucose tolerance test. Also, the patient's uh, glycosylated hemoglobin test or the HbA1c, they're both the same thing, glycosylated hemoglobin test or the HbA1c will be elevated and over six and a half is usually about where it's over, six and a half. That's considered uh, diabetic. Um, HbA1c reflects the patient's glucose level over a time frame of about 90 days. So once again, the glycosylated hemoglobin checks to see the patient's, uh, what the average glucose was for the past 90 days. Um, and it's a better picture of the patient's history of, of how well their blood sugar was managed, right? Managed. And it's not just what they ate the day before, right? So they don't need a fast for the glycosylated hemoglobin or the HbA1c, that's the same test. They don't need to, um, they don't need to fast for that test because it's looking at the past 90 days, right? Your text explains these different tests in detail. Um, so make sure that you go and check them out, right? The You wanna look at the glucose tolerance test. That's the test that's given to patients who um, may have diabetes and the doctor wants to rule it in or rule it out. And then the HbA1c or glycosylated hemoglobin looks at what the patient's blood pressure, sorry, blood pressure, that's hilarious. It looks at the patient's blood sugar for the last 90 days. Um, so let's get to how we're going to work with our patients to assess, for example, uh, the diabetes mellitus. First of all, we will get a health history from the patients. What is their age? What is their ethnicity? Did their parents have diabetes? Any siblings have diabetes? For women, did they have a high weight babies or gestational diabetes? Do they have recent changes in their own weight? What is the current weight? Are they in the obese category? Are they complaining of fatigue, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia? Have they had a change in their vision? Do they have small cuts that don't tend to heal? These could all be signs and symptoms for risks for developing diabetes or they're already having diabetes, right? So again, your book goes over um, many assessments in detail, so I would recommend that you take a look at that because it's got some good examples in there. Okay, so again, here are some really good possible nursing diagnoses uh, that you might want to select if your patient has diabetes, right? So please pause this, pause this video, write these down and make sure that you understand them, okay? Here are some possible outcomes or goals for your patients with diabetes. These goals um, are general, but you'll wanna make sure you um, pick specific ones for your patient that are measurable with specific timeframes. So this is like a starting point for, um, for goals, and then you'll wanna make them smart, right? So I, again, would recommend that you pause the video and create some smart goals from, from this list. 
Okay, medical management of diabetes. The goal of therapy will be to normalize insulin activity and get the blood glucose levels within normal ranges to reduce the development of vascular and neuropathic complications. These include retinopathy, right? Remember I told you the, the vessels behind the eyes are really small and therefore are affected first. That's true about the sex organs too, right? The, uh, the vessels in the sex organs are also really thin so they're affected as well right uh nephro nephropathy neuro, neuropathy and retinopathy uh, we will go into detail later on in this powerpoint the therapy should be aggressive and the patient needs to know the consequences of not having controlled blood sugar Many patients who are diabetic don't understand the damage that's being done because they can't see the damage, right? But it's our jobs as nurses to make sure they get how important it is to regulate their blood glucose levels and how quickly damage can occur if they don't. Um, again, this, sometimes this is challenging because they can't feel that their blood sugar is elevated um, and that complications are occurring literally every minute. Proper nutrition, proper meal planning, proper weight control or reduction, and increased activity are all the foundations of diabetic uh, management. Nurses must be knowledgeable about nutritional therapy to support the patient's new diet and lifestyle changes. Goals of therapy would be to keep blood sugar levels within normal range. So normal range is looking at uh, fasting would be 70 to 100 and non-fasting would be 100 to about 140. Now, please keep in mind that if a patient's blood sugar is above 150, then the kidneys are having to work too hard and the patient's going to be spilling urine, uh, I'm sorry, sugar into the urine. So they're gonna be spilling glucose over into the urine, meaning, um, again, that their kidneys are having to work too hard. So we don't want that, right? We want their blood glucose levels to be below 150. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to tell you? Um, again, goals of therapy would be to keep the blood sugar levels within normal range, obtain a lipid and lipoprotein level to assess the risk for vascular disease, right? And if, um, and if it's high, we want to lower these amounts. We want to monitor blood pressure levels, make sure that they don't have hypertension. Remember, it's the silent killer, so they could be walking around with that, which of course would make their diabetes worse. Um, and then, so we want to keep their blood pressure within normal ranges, prevent complications, take into account personal and cultural preferences for food choices. We do want to encourage healthier foods that will help maintain a level blood glucose, right? So that it's not high and then low and then high and so forth. Um, but we do wanna look at cultural preferences as well, right? And feed those into a healthy diet. So we're gonna modify them. Um, if a patient is overweight, then the goal would be to reduce their BMI to under 25. Most people with type two diabetes can reduce or eliminate the need to take medication if they can get to a healthy body weight. Your patients may also benefit from doing a diabetic support group to keep up the necessary changes in diet, lifestyle, exercise, all of these things needed to help control their blood sugars. Meal planning is essential to dietary modification success. The goal is to maintain as much consistency as possible in the amount of calories, as well as carbohydrates ingested at each meal, along with consistent meal times to prevent hypoglycemia from occurring, right? As well as to maintain a more even blood sugar. Review the patient's diet history to identify eating habits, eating lifestyles, and cultural patterns. Caloric requirements are calculated to help a patient maintain or lose weight, or even put on weight for some. Carbohydrate counting is essential as carbohydrates are more quickly digested and converted into glucose than any other type of food. 100% of carbohydrates is converted to glucose. So let me repeat that. 100% of carbohydrates is converted to glucose. Recommended carbohydrate um, intake uh, daily should be about 50 to 60% of the caloric intake. 
Um, 20 to 30 of the percent of caloric intake should come from fats, and then the remaining 10 to 20 should come from protein. The majority of the carbohydrates should be from whole grains and vegetables and not from concentrated sweets. So again, the majority of the carbs should be coming from complex carbs like whole grains and veggies and not from simple carbs like sugar. Saturated fat should be less than 10% of the total intake and dietary cholesterol should be less than 300 milligrams per day. Protein intake should also include some non-animal sources like uh, legumes and whole grains, beans, those kinds of things um, to help decrease the amount of saturated fat as well as cholesterol that's being ingested. About 50% of protein is converted to glucose. Uh, we're going to encourage our patients to increase fiber in the diet because this decreases the need for exogenous. Uh, this decreases the need for insulin. So again, increasing fiber decreases the need for um, the exogenesis uh, insulin. And not only that, but fiber can improve blood glucose levels and lower cholesterol. So it's, it's encouraged, okay? Fiber, good, good, good. Uh, along with we push fluids with fiber, obviously, so the patient doesn't get constipated. The majority of the fiber should come from soluble fiber as the um, soluble fiber di digest slower and therefore the glucose uptake is slower, right? Any increase in fiber in the diet should also be done with increasing water again so as not to increase the risk for constipation. Your patient will be taught to select food choices based on an exchange list by using the allotted number of carbohydrates, the allotted number of proteins, fats, and free choice items. Um, and your text goes into this in detail as well. Pause, pause the video and take a moment to look at that. The patient will also need to be taught to read food labels for their nutritional content. Make sure they look at not only the breakdown of the content of the food and the calories, but also they need to look at per serving. That can be tricky, right? Um, there may be two to three servings per container, even if they're really small containers. So make sure they read that. And it, because if they eat the whole thing and they think it's one serving, but it's actually three, that's problem, right? They're going to get way too many everything, including carbs. Another method is healthy food choices by counting the number of carbohydrate servings. Remember the exercise we did in clinical lab with the fake food and carb counting? Uh, this is an example of that. And then remember we went over myplate.gov. It's actually a really excellent resource for patients that they can help turn and develop uh, meal plans. So I would highly recommend that. We, we refer patients there all the time. Okay, glycemic index. So the term glycemic index refers to how much a given food increases the blood glucose level compared with an equivalent amount of glucose. The dietary recommendation to try to not raise the blood sugar levels sharply after food ingestion is listed on this slide. Please pause the video and take a moment and read through, through them. Other dietary concerns. So the other things to address with your diabetic patients are their alcohol consumption, using sweeteners, and misleading food labels. There's a lot out there. They don't need to eliminate alcohol altogether, but moderation of alcohol consumption is recommended. And they should be made aware that the uh, fruity drinks or foo-foo drinks that are often, you know, they're often referred to as foo-foo. It's the ones, you know, the, the drinks that have all the flavors and stuff. They have a lot of hidden sugars in them, so they got to be careful with that. Uh, patients should consume food if they are going to drink alcohol, but again, in moderation, as this might increase their blood sugar levels. One alcoholic beverage for women and two for men a day is considered within moderation. The use of artificial sweeteners is allowed. Nutritive sweeteners include um, some calories. Non-nutritive sweeteners have minimal or no calories and do not raise blood sugar levels. Have your patients be aware that if something is labeled sugar-free or sugarless or diabetic, that it may still provide calories equivalent to sugar-containing products. Um, these are not free foods and they still may have calories, fat, and sugar. So they need to be careful on that, okay? 
Exercise, I cannot stress this enough. Exercise is a very important element in diabetes and blood sugar management. It lowers blood glucose and reduces the cardiovascular risks. Regular exercise should become part of the diabetic patient's routine. Your text refers to these recommendations for diabetics. Please pause the video again and go review them. There are some special considerations you might need to consider for your patient with complications of neuropathy and retinopathy. As those individuals may need to alter their usual exercise routine to accommodate these complications or have tests like stress tests done prior to starting an exercise regimen to make sure it's safe and that they're safe to do so. Generally, exercise should start out simple like walking and increase, you know, gradually, right? Exercise precautions. So there are some precautions that should be followed when starting an exercise regimen with diabetics. People who take insulin should have a 15 gram carbohydrate snack, like a piece of fruit or a complex carbohydrate prior to moderate exercise to prevent them from having a hypoglycemic reaction. After strenuous or prolonged exercise, the insulin-dependent diabetic should prepare to eat a carbohydrate snack at the end of the session and a bedtime um, and at bedtime so as to prevent, again, a hypoglycemic, hypoglycemic episode. That's where your blood sugar drops too low, right? It is also recommended that they check their blood glucose levels more often, preferably before, during, and after exercise, because they want to see how their body's handling um, the exercise and, and the uh, glucose and insulin, right? Non-insulin dependent diabetics may not need to eat a snack before exercise. Advantages for exercise in the elderly is to decrease um, in hyperglycemia, it is also a sense of well-being and possible weight loss too, right? Exercise should start out slow again and increase gradually. The patient should get a physical exam or consult a physician or physical therapist for evaluation prior to beginning an exercise program just to ensure that they're safe, right? Safe. Blood glucose monitoring is essential in diabetic management. This allows for detection of elevations or a decrease in the blood, uh, the patient's blood sugar and gives them a, the ability to respond to that increase or decrease. Uh, they should be taking their blood glucose levels at least three to five times a day, so before every meal, and then in the morning and then again in the afternoon. Um, there are a variety of meters available and the method of testing should match the patient's skill level. Again, if you wanna make sure somebody got it, you want to have them teach you back, right? Most of any error that occur with the reading is due to operator error and not the machine, right? They're typically right. The patient must follow the specific instructions provided to them from the manufacturer. Again, we are going to teach them how to take their blood glucose, right? So we're going to walk them through literally step by step, showing them, and then we're going to have return demonstration back and have the patient show us. Teach them to rotate their fingers and use the side of their finger and not the pad of their finger. Make sure the fingers are warm and they have washed them with soap and water really well, warm, warm soap and water really well prior to using the lancet, right? We don't want them to get an infection. Have them hold their finger down because that'll have the blood go to that area and then place the lancet firmly on the side of the finger, you know, on the surface of the side of the finger. Um, so they're going to prick the finger with the lancet. Then the first thing they're going to do is wipe away the first drop of blood. And then they're going to use the second drop. Um, they're going to, after wiping away the first drop, they're going to milk their finger, which is literally just pushing the blood, um, toward the, the lanced finger, right? And then, uh, so they're going to push their blood to the site. They're going to apply a cotton ball after they've gotten their sample over the puncture site, apply pressure for a minute or two longer if they're on anticoagulants. They should be consistent uh, with the timing of the test and teach them about infection control measures and cleaning their machine, right? They should be uh, keeping a running record of their test results because this is something the doctors want going to want to look at when they come in for their follow-up appointments, right? 
Um, and they also need to be advised that if their blood sugar levels are too high or too low, they should be contacting their physicians um, so they can have conversations about do they need to adjust their diet? Do they need to adjust their insulin orders? Like what needs to be changed to help manage their diabetes a little bit better? And of course, in the beginning, when someone is newly diagnosed, this can take time to get the right regulation of diet and or insulin, right? To ensure that the patient's managed effectively. Um, there may also need to be a, uh, a need to test for ketones in their urine, right? Again, remember, ketones are the byproducts of fat breakdown that occurs when the body does not have enough glucose for the cells, so it starts breaking down fat uh, that is stored for energy, right? This should be routinely done for people with type 1 diabetes. Let me repeat that. Type 1 diabetics should routinely be checking for ketones in their urine to make sure that that's not occurring. Insulin therapy must be initiated for people with, again, with type 1 diabetes uh, because insulin is needed to sustain life. And um, insulin will be initiated for type 2 diabe diabetics where oral hypoglycemic um, agents are no longer working, okay? There are a number of different types of insulins with different onsets, peaks, and durations, and you need to know them all, right, as we mentioned in class. We will go into these in more detail in the coming slides. Also refer to your book to compare and contrast the different insulins. Insulin regimens vary from uh, one to six injections a day, depending upon the person and their response to the different particular insulins. Again, your book compares and contrasts contrast them um, and how to work around meal times and how they work in combination, all kinds of wonderful stuff in your book. So please pause the video, take a moment to review these in your book and understand why we may give a combination of insulin therapy when we would give these different insulins and why. We are gonna talk a little bit more about it. Insulins have different types. The rapid acting is just like it says. It has a quick onset and lasts only two to four hours. It peaks at an hour later. Short acting doesn't kick in as quickly. It has a peak at two to three hours and it lasts up to six hours. It is important to know the onset, peak, and duration of all of the insulins we are covering because you need to know if it's important for the patient to eat right away when they would be vulnerable for a hypoglycemic reaction, and how long the insulin is in their system. Patients taking insulin should keep a tight schedule. Absorption is the fastest in the subcutaneous tissue in the abdomen, then the back of the arm, then the thigh, and lastly, the buttock area. The patient needs to rotate the sites, and it can be within one anatomical site, right? Anatomical site, good grief. So um, it just needs to be rotated because if they don't rotate the site, then they can build up scar tissue, which isn't good. So again, it could be one anatomical site like the abdomen, not a problem. They just need to make sure that they're rotating the site frequently, like every other injection, right? So every other injection, they need to be at a, every injection, they need to be at a different site. Um, and they need to make sure that they're administering it at the correct angle for the subcutaneous tissue, right? Oftentimes you will give a mixed insulin injection. When mixing insulins, you want to first inject the air into the longer acting insulin or the cloudy insulin. Then move over to the regular or rapid acting insulin and inject air in there. Then you tip that vial upside down and pull out the prescribed amount. Then you're going to take your syringe out of that. Go back to the cloudy or long acting insulin and draw out the correct amount, making sure not to accidentally push in any of the short acting insulin into that longer acting acting insulin bottle. Okay. Every time you inject the needle into the stopper, it dulls it. So we use this method to minimize sticks into the stopper and to also um, helps prevent contaminating the short acting insulin with the longer acting insulin and thus rendering the short acting insulin infective, uh, ineffective, right? 
So go to the website link that is in this video, pause the video, click on the link and watch every step that she does in the video that walks you through how to do this. You'll need to know how to do it. Um, so because one, we may end up doing it in clinical, two, you're gonna do it as a nurse, and three, you're gonna be tested on it. Not only on our test, but also on HESI and NCLEX. So again, um, let's see, insulins can be delivered, again, various ways. Injection is one method of delivery. There are also insulin pens that, there are also pre-filled cartridges, pre-loaded cartridges with insulin in them. The patient literally will dial up the required dose and then inject it with one of those uh, insulin pens. Uh, they are most effective for people uh, who only require one type of insulin, right? So they work great for people who only need one type of insulin. Um, there are also injectors that deliver insulin through the skin under pressure. And then there are insulin pumps also. And these insulin pumps can give a continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion with the use of a small externally worn device that closely mimics the functioning of our normal pancreas, right? A needle, uh, a needle or catheter is inserted and the pump is carried in the patient's clothing, right? The needle or catheter needs to be changed about every three days. They are convenient because the patients don't need to carry extra supplies. They don't need to inject, inject themselves multiple times a day. And again, it just delivers the, the required dosage for the patient, right? Um, patients will still need to check their blood glucose levels several times throughout the day just to make sure it's accurate. Okay, sliding scales, we, we have um, at every facility, whether it's a group home sniff, um, hospice, hospitals, you name it, we all have what's called a sliding scale for our regular insulin um, that we give with meals and for many patients at bedtime as well. So this is, this is a general sliding scale. They're all very, very similar. And it literally tells you if, for example, on this slide here, if your patient's blood glucose is between 201 and 250, you're going to give four units, right, of regular insulin. Intermediate and long-acting insulin is on this side slide. Make sure to review the onset, peak, and duration again of these insulins. Levomir and Lantus are the long-acting insulins, and long-acting insulins are never, ever mixed with other insulins. Never, ever. Here is our Lantus, again, or Levomir, has onset, peak, and duration, um, and we it's used as a basal dose, okay? So again, pause the video, make uh, flashcards, get this information into your long-term memory, okay? And this is a great slide. I really, really love this slide because it shows you all the different types of insulins when they start, peak, um, all of it, right? So again, make some flashcards, get the onset peak duration um, into your long-term memory. Um, so insulin preparations vary according to the time um, of course action manufacturer. Our Lippincott book goes into detail on um, the advantages and disadvantages of each type of insulin. I would highly recommend that you go review that information, take notes. And we do have two general approaches to insulin therapy um, include conventional therapy and intensive therapy. And compared with intensive insulin therapy, conventional insulin therapy is much less effective at preventing complications associated with type 1 diabetes. So it's usually only considered as a treatment option for people with type 1 diabetes who can't have intensive insulin therapy, okay? So we, we prefer intensive insulin therapy because again, um, patients who they're well better well managed and thus they have less complications but we will do conventional therapy if you know they can't tolerate the intensive uh, therapy so just so you know um again intensive insulin regimens is when we attempt to mimic the body's 
own natural pattern of insulin secretion and therefore deliver replacement insulin using the concepts of basal insulin coverage and bolus insulin coverage, right? So we're trying to mimic the pancreas basically, right? Okay, so complications of insulin therapy. Obviously, we, you know, you could be allergic to anything, right? And patients, again, can develop an allergy at any time. Happens all the time with all meds. Um, they can get systemic allergic reactions, right? Um, they can develop resistance to the insulin that we're putting in the body. Um, and then they can also get what's called morning hyperglycemia. And that is uh, the, called Dawn phenomenon, D-A-W-N phenomenon. So what that is, is when a low blood sugar hypoglycemia episode happens overnight, leads to a high blood sugar or hyperglycemia in the morning due to a surge, surge of hormones, okay? So again, uh, what is morning hyperglycemia in type 1 diabetes, right? It's called Dawn Phenomenon. It's a common cause of high blood sugar levels in the morning for people with diabetes. Again, it's due to the natural increase in certain hormones in the early morning hours, right? Um, and so treatment for Dawn Phenomenon dawn phenomenon varies depending upon um, you know the patient's existing uh, diabe diabetes medications but they'll usually adjust the dose the night before uh, to compensate for that um, rise in the morning right oh and I did I'm sorry I missed insulin lipodystrophy um, in in the PowerPoint, my apologies. So uh, lipo or lipo uh, hypertrophy or lipo dystrophy is when a person injects insulin or another medication. It could happen with other meds in the same patch of skin over and over, right? So they're not, they're not uh, rotating their sites. So not only do they get um, scar tissue buildup, but they can get this thing that's called lipodystrophy or lipodystrophy and that literally is um a buildup of the fat protein scar tissue in that area and and it causes uh the um skin it looks like a dimpling or a crater of the underlying skin because what's literally happened is it it results in the subcutaneous or fat tissue breaking down in that area because of the uh, repeated injections of meds in that same area, right? So that's why we have to rotate those sites. All right. Methods of insulin delivery. So there's the insulin pens we were talking about, and there's the insulin pump on the top picture that we were talking about. Obviously, we have um, insulin pens, um, implantable insulin pumps. Many times patients will put them on their arms. Then we have the standard uh, needle and syringe, you know, the multi-dose vials, all of those kinds of things. So they come in multiple methods, right? Um, so educating your patient on how to use an insulin uh, self-management, right? Um, so we're going to show them again how to do the injections, and then we're going to have a repeat, have them show us, right? So teach back how to, one, take their blood glucose. We talked about that already. And two, how to actually do their injections in their subcutaneous fat, right? And the different sites. Um, we're going to definitely go over all of these signs and symptoms of hypo glycemia versus hyperglycemia, which we're going to talk about in detail later in this PowerPoint. And it's extremely important you guys know that. So make sure you pause the video when it comes up and take very detailed notes. Please be aware, hypoglycemia will kill you much quicker than hyperglycemia, right? You only have, you don't have a lot of room there for hypoglycemia, right? 70 to 100 fasting blood glucose, right? And so this is somebody with hypoglycemia would be like 50, anything below 60 basically, right? And once they get to 50, uh, it's a big problem. So, um, hyperglycemia it will kill you over time and it will destroy your organs but you can live with an elevated blood sugar level of 200 300 for quite a while right uh, before it starts to actually break down uh, and and send you into 
other different things that you're going to talk about in block two. Um, let's see. Okay. Yeah. So you're going to, whatever, if they're using insulin pumps, again, you're going to go over those in detail, things that can go wrong, where to troubleshoot them, all of that, right? Oral anti-diabetic agents are used for people who have type 2 diabetes. They can be used similarly or in combination. They can produce hypoglycemic reactions just like insulin can. So you got to be aware that if someone's taking an anti-diabetic agent like metformin, that alone can cause a patient's blood glucose level to drop low. So we got to teach them again about the signs and symptoms of hypo and hyperglycemia. Um, the patients need to monitor their blood glucose while on these meds, and they have to be educated on the specifics of their prescribed medications. Again, the book lists all the common oral anti-diabetic medications. I want you to pause the video and specifically look at metformin. Um, this is the one that we're going to test you on in block one. Okay, so this is where the oral anti-diabetics work in the body, um, like metformin, um, hydrochloride. It's a uh, Ooh, I always slaughter this word. Biguanide, biguanide, biguanide. I don't know. That B-I-G-U-A-N-I-D-E. Okay, one of the most common interventions for drug therapy will be metformin hydrochloride or glucophage. Um, this is an oral anti-diabetic medication. This is the first medication they usually try in type 2 diabetes. It is relatively inexpensive, has few side effects, and does not induce weight gain or other complications, typically. Um, it should be taken with food, and the patients must monitor the kidney and liver functioning, or the doctors will, obviously, but patients need to be aware that the doctors need to order kidney and liver function tests to ensure that these organs are perfusing and healthy. Um, so that's bun, creatinine, ALT, and AST, right? Bun and creatinine being the kidney labs, and AST and ALT being the liver labs, right? Medication, uh, metformin is contraindicated for patients over the age of 80 or patients with an increased risk for developing a buildup of lactic acid, okay, uh, because they'll go in lactic acidosis. Now, does that mean you won't see patients who are over 80 on this medication? No, that just means that they're being way more closely monitored, right? And I'll be honest, doctors do have the conversation with the patients of the risk benefit conversation that happens when they turn 80 um, if they're on metformin. Um, other conversations being held with patients would be, you know, patients who have decreased kidney and or liver functioning, uh, respiratory insufficiency, alcohol abuse, or patients with severe infections, because there are risks to taking metformin under these situations. So again, there would be a risk benefit analysis conversation being had by the doctor with these patients to determine if in fact, the risks outweigh the, uh, the you know, if the benefits, sorry, outweigh the risks, then they'll continue to take it. But if the risks are too much for the patients, they may opt not to, not to take the medication, right? Um, again, we need to educate the patients on what these signs and symptoms look like so they can report any of these signs and symptoms of lactic acidosis to their provider stat, okay? Um, these include things like dizziness, lightheadedness, stomach pain, a feeling of coldness, muscle pain, respiratory distress, increased somnolence, right? Um, and then abdominal distress, that's big. Um, tell the patients what uh, this looks like, what the original pill, you need to tell them also that you know, different manufacturers make the pills, they may look different, right? So that can change. Um, uh, sometimes they might see the full pill in their stool. Um, and it might just be the outer coating of the pill. And that's okay. It's not a big deal because that's an inactive part of the medication. So not a problem, right? So again, uh, if they see the capsule part of the pill, the outside part of the pill, it's the inactive part of the pill, so it's okay. Um, so again, acute co 
complications of diabetes, right? Would be hypoglycemia. You definitely want to know signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia which we're definitely going to talk in detail on the next slide. They could get DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis. They could get hyperglycemic hyperosmolar syndrome or HHS. They could get DI, diabetic uh, diabetes insipidus. And DKA, DI, and HHS are all going to be discussed in block three. So you don't need to know them for block one. You just need to have a bigger idea that there are so many things that uh, diabetes can lead to. Okay. For block one, we're focusing on type one and type two, and you do need to know type one and type two. Okay. Um, Let's see, we need to provide uh, patient education on glucose and diabetes. Nurse needs to focus on teaching healthy eating habits, teaching the patient to be active, monitor their blood sugar levels, take their medications as prescribed, how to problem solve if they are um, feeling sick or feeling down or not feeling 100%, um, healthy coping strategies, and how to reduce their risks, right? And we talked a lot about some of the things like losing weight and things like that, right? Survival skills are essential for anyone taking insulin. These guidelines are listed in your text. Please pause the video and review that information because it's really important. Patients should also be taught to continue to seek education on diabetes to broaden their mastery of managing their disease. The nurse, the nurse must also assess the patient's readiness to learn. The nurse, the nurse, I keep calling him a nurse, that's funny. The nurse must also assess the stage of grieving the patient is in so that we can select an appropriate time to do the education, right? It would not be right after the doctor tells them that they have this life-altering diagnosis, right? Um, we want to give them a little bit of time to grieve. So again, pick the right time to educate um, and not when they're still in shock or in the denial phase, right? Um, because your education is going to fall on deaf ears if you do it during that time. So it's useless, right? You want to also assess their literacy level, uh, their level of support at home, uh, their financial resources. Are they going to have the money to buy all of these things they're going to need? Testing strips, the insulin, the injection needles, everything, right? Um, you want to assess the patient's daily routines. Uh, so that you can assess if there's any challenges that you perceive are going to be needed with their injections, their meal planning, all of that, right? And you want to assess their neurological deficits that they might have, as well as their cultural beliefs, right? Because that's going to come into play with, with managing their chronic illness now. The experienced patient may also be grieving due to the setback that they're currently having with their diabetes being unmanaged, or they may be anxious and ready to learn to try to prevent another exacerbation, right? The nurse will need to assess this prior to beginning any, any education because we're going to need to know exactly what pathway we're going to take when we go to educate them, right? The method of education and the support materials that are needed will vary based on where the patient lies in this process, right? Uh, we have pamphlets and videos and written handouts in different languages with different literacy levels, all of that, right? And again, we are going to give them the pamphlets and information after we go through the education, but remember that the only way to really know if a patient got the education is to have them teach us back, right? So that's the best way to do it. Although we will give them the pamphlets and all that too to refer back to later on. Um, so I would recommend you go into Lipincott Advisor, go to the disease tab, search, diabetes mellitus 2, scroll down to the bottom, select patient teaching handout, and look and see at all the wonderful, great information that is available to them and available to you as a student that you can print out and go over with your patient, right? You could practice this in clinicals because there's going to be patients we're definitely going to have, um, you know, that have diabetes type 2 and type 1. Um, also, there's support groups available to the patients um, that will be well informed, that will also give them support, emotional support. Um, the patients will also need to be taught about administering their insulin if they are insulin dependent. 
Um, again, we already taught you all about this, right? But please read through it so that you have a good understanding of it, right? And self-care teaching needs include addressing any underlying factors that may affect the patient's ability to follow the diabetic treatment regimen. Um, if it is simple enough, make sure the plan is customized to the patient's particular needs. You want to always use positive reinforcement, right? So if a patient uh, teaches you know, does teach back to you and they don't do it exactly 100%, still use positive uh, reinforcement for them. So you're going to say, you know, great job. Next time, try doing that at a 45 degree angle instead of a 90 degree angle or whatever your corrective behavior is. Always start out with a, hey, great job. Next time, try this though kind of thing, right? So you're using that positive reinforcement to get your point across, right? gets the patient motivated. It encourages them to focus on, you know, what they can do still to manage their diabetes. And, you know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't even, does it in a positive manner, right? And let's see, what else do I want to tell you? Um, you also need, uh, must assess if they need continuing care through outpatient services because they're in the hospital now, we're discharging them home. I will tell you if you, because they're new diabetics, you got to be real careful and make sure that they get the insulin injections a hundred percent. And if they don't, then they are appropriate for home health. Teaching new diabetics how to do insulin injections safely is a viable home health uh, task. So if it's a new diabetic, I would recommend that the patients at least for some time get home health uh, support in their home so that a um, nurse can keep them safe while they're learning how to do their injections and managing their their diets and diabetes and testing and doing all of that, you know, their blood glucose tests and all of that. So make referrals as necessary and indicated, okay? Okay, hypoglycemia. All patients taking insulin as well as non-insulin and oral anti-diabetic meds like metformin um, or glyburide, right? another anti-diabetic med, are at risk for hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia can be caused by many factors. These include too much insulin compared to what the patient ate or how much exercise they did that day, maybe the wrong insulin at the wrong time of the day or the wrong dose, or it could be decreased liver production of glucose after alcohol consumption. For example, it could be due to an increased insulin sensitivity after the patient begins exercising and they start losing weight. It could be due to decreased clearance of insulin in the kidneys because the patient has kidney failure. Um, it could be due to an increased amount of stress for that patient for the day. It could be due to other meds like steroids. Steroids increase people's, uh, it causes hyperglycemia in the body, right? Um, so it raises blood sugar levels. Um, gosh, there's so many reasons that a patient could go into hypoglycemia, right? Uh, the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia are listed here um, and include sweating, tremors, um, and it's a cold sweat, right? Um, so cold and clammy is hypoglycemia. Tremors, tachycardia, palpitations, nervousness, the, the, they get hunger. Uh, because the brain knows it needs glucose, right? They, it knows it. So that's that natural instinct of hunger. Uh, the patient is unable to concentrate because the brain cannot function without glucose. So they literally get confused and agitated and they slur their speech and they get headaches and, and memory lapses and drowsy. Um, and they get disoriented and they ha may have a loss of consciousness. And if the hypoglycemia is severe enough, then they could lose consciousness and die. They could die if the blood glucose gets low enough, okay? Because the brain, again, cannot function without, uh, without glucose.
Again, take take a moment, pause the video, make yourself flashcards because you need to know this information for the remainder of your career as a nurse. Here's a really helpful uh, mnemonic for hypo and hyperglycemia. Hot and dry, sugar high, meaning your blood sugar is through the roof. You get hot and dry. And then cold and clammy, you need some candy because you're hypoglycemic. So you get really cold and really clammy. Management of hypoglycemia. So next we are going to discuss about what you need to know to teach your patients what to do at home if they end up getting low blood glucose or what to teach your families on how to treat the patient's low blood sugar at home, right? Um, so they have, we're going to educate our patients who are diabetic to carry glucose tabs with them. So again, they should always carry glucose tabs or candy or crackers uh, with them at all times so that when they have an episode of hypoglycemia, they have something on hand to respond to it. Because when hypoglycemia occurs, it happens quickly and the patients will have only seconds to respond if that, okay? So I always tell my patients to drink, um, you know, some orange juice or apple juice. Uh, apple juice if they have a hypoglycemic reaction in their home and take with some cracked crackers um, and then follow up with with a protein uh, right after right so maybe some cheese or peanut butter or something along those lines right so a simple sugar to if they're in hypoglycemia they're going to take 15 to 20 grams of fast acting concentrated simple carbs so three to four glucose tabs um four to six ounces of regular soda juice um, i know some people say no to orange juice but honestly it works fine uh, so four to six ounces of regular soda apple juice orange juice or three to four glucose tabs, and then they want to follow up with protein right after though. Because what happens if they don't, they're going to peak and then they're going to drop again and have another hypoglycemic reaction shortly thereafter in the next couple hours, right? Because, because again, they're going to peak and then drop. So the way we get them to not drop is to follow up with some protein after, okay? Um, and then they should wait about 15 minutes, retest their blood glucose levels until they get a reading of 70 or higher twice in a row, okay? Um, let's see. And then they should plan to eat a meal within the hour um, after that. If they are if it's an emergency and the patient's unconscious then obviously they can't swallow safely so we're going to give them subcutaneous or intramuscular one milligram of glucagon or we call 911 and because if they're in the home we're going to call 911 and in and if we do that then we're going to give them 25 to 50 milliliters of 50 percent dextrose iv solution okay emergency situations again if there's an emergent situation and they are unconscious and they were at a facility we would administer glucagon sub qrim or dextrose iv next we are going to skip over dka and hhs as you're going to get that information again in block three Complications of diabetes. There are major complications that occur with diabetes. When you have hyperglycemia, the blood vessels actually change and can cause hypoxia to the nerves and the axons and myelin sheath are permanently damaged. Cardiovascular disease can develop. Most patients with diabetes mellitus will die from a thrombic event like a myocardial infarct or heart attack. Patients with diabetes also have increased levels of C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker and raises the risk for cardiovascular disease as well as death. It also raises the risk for development of atherosclerosis with diabetes. 
risk of strokes is two to four times higher in patients with diabetes. And if they have a stroke, they are, they are usually way more extensive damage done. I envision changes occur also due to the extensive amount of small capillaries in those organs. Um, and also the damage to those vessels, they receive less oxygen and nutrients over time, therefore leading to um, blindness many times. Actually, legal blindness is 25 times more likely to occur in diabetes mellitus. Uh, diagnoses like retinopathy, retinal hemorrhage, optic nerve atrophy from hypoxia, blurred vision, all of these things occur much more frequently in diabetics. Diabetic neuropathy is the progression of damage to the nerves as well as their functions. It leads to weakness, pain, decrease in sensation, Excess glucose converts into sorbitol that collects in the nerves and decreases nerve conduction. Diabetic patients also create path uh, pathological changes in the kidneys. Patients that are diabetic will develop hypertension in the kidney blood vessels that leads to increased uh, kidney perfusion that leads to leaking of the blood vessels that leads to decreased kidney functioning and will eventually lead to kidney failure, right? Diabetes mellitus is the number one cause of end-stage renal disease or kidney disease. Um, it also leads to mal erectile dysfunction. It's another complication. And the incidence is about 50% in diabetic patients and usually develops within 10 to 15 years of having type 2 diabetes. Cognitive impairment also occurs in diabetics due to the changes in the blood vessels and resulting hypoxemia. Now the key to preventing all of these complications is tight control of the patient's blood glucose levels at all times, right? And if they do develop pain in their neuropathy, then the patient may be treated in a variety of, it, of ways. This includes administering anticonvulsants or antidepressants. These methods have not officially been approved for these purposes, but have um, shown some benefits, right? Uh, creams may also be used to help with the burning sensation. And again, patients should not stop the the treatments abruptly. They should not stop these medications abruptly. Um, let's see. For reduced vision, patients should have regular eye exams and they should manage their environment appropriately, right? By having proper lighting and low vision aids and magnifiers. And if they have lost their hearing, they should have audio and audio aids, right, as well as visual aids, right? Neuropathic ulcers, the highest percentage of amputations is attributed to people with poorly controlled diabetes. Diabetic complications of neuropathy, peripheral vascular disease, being immunocompromised, all of these things leaves the patients vulnerable to diabetic foot ulcers. It usually starts with a minor soft tissue injury that doesn't heal. Remember we talked in class about this and the fact that the lack of blood flow causes, you know, with the increased glucose in the blood, it makes it so thick, right? Um, and we know that it gets worse over time and can become chronic, right? So these wounds just don't heal. They don't get the uh, blood flow. It's uh, less oxygenated. It's thicker. And therefore, the skin in that area doesn't get perfused as well, right? Remember, the core of the body is going to feed itself with blood first. And the most distal or most the, the tissue furthest away from the body is the most at risk and being compromised. So that would include the feet and hands, right? Um, so how do we prevent this? We The patients need to manage their blood glucose level at all times, right? Ensuring that the blood isn't too thick with that glucose and ensuring um, that the complications are less, right? Part of the diabetic treatment regimen includes diabetic foot care. Uh, patients need to inspect their feet daily. They need to keep their feet clean and dry. Um, they should never put lotion in between their toes. Um, 
Again, they can they can lubricate the heels of their toes, but they should never ever put um, lotion between their toes because it causes skin breakdown and it leaves their patients vulnerable for infection, right? Um, they should never ever go barefoot. Uh, they should always wear closed toe sh shoes. Their shoes should fit well and they need to rotate their shoes every other day because their feet, because of the neuropathy, their feet can get used to us uh, using the same shoes two days in a row. So again, they should use always wear closed toe shoes and they should switch them every other day, right? Um, because they don't want to have pressure on the, their feet be the same. Uh, they should have their toenails trimmed by a podiatrist only. And their toenails need to be trimmed straight across, right? Not in a curved pattern. Um, Let's see, what else do I want to tell you? They should reduce their risk factors of peripheral vascular disease. Um, they should never use home remedies to treat foot problems. Instead, they need to go to, again to a podiatrist uh, for everything. Um, and they should seek out immediate medical attention if they notice any area of compromise. So any pain, callus, numbness, ulcers, deformities, reduce blood flow, all of that, they need to seek out immediate help. Um, other neuropathic complications would be peripheral neuropathy, autonomic neuropathies, hypoglycemic unawareness, and sexual dysfunction. Again, pause the video, go to your book, make yourself note cards of this information so that you're able to uh, understand it and pick it out from examples given on HESI, NCLEX, and your tests. Okay, special issues, final slide. Some special things to consider would be when the patient is under physiologic stress, like surgery, um, because with stress comes the stress hormones that will trigger an increase in our blood glucose levels, right? So obviously we need to be aware of this. Hypoglycemia may be experienced preoperatively due to the fact that patients have to be NPO eight hours before surgery, right? So your text goes over approaches to managing glucose control in the preoperative phase. Please pause the video and take a moment to review that. About 25% of the hospitalized patients have diabetes. You will need to closely monitor their blood glucose levels and take the opportunity to assess their knowledge base of diabetes and provide further education as indicated. If able, promote uh, promote them to actively take care of their diabetes while hospitalized. Observe their self-care activities and help teach them where indicated. Hyperglycemia is common during hospitalization due to a change in the patient's treatment regimen, including additional medications, certain IV solutions that may have dextrose in them, mistreatment of insulin for hyperglycemia, or maybe mismatched timing of meals and insulin administration. Nurses should pay close attention and look for these possible problems for our diabetic patients. Hypoglycemia can also be a problem. This could be due to overuse of the sliding scale. It could be due to lack of change in insulin when diet changes. It could be due to aggressive treatment of hyperglycemia. It could be due to delayed meals after the insulin has been given. There's so, so many reasons, right? Um, Successive doses of regular insulin should never be given more than every three to four hours. You want to arrange for snacks if meals are going to be delayed. Uh, patients who are MPO should not be receiving the same amount of insulin that they would normally be getting if they were eating regularly, right? Um, we know that they're still going to get insulin, but the dose will probably be less than if they were consuming food, right? Rapid acting insulin may be eliminated and decreasing the intermediate acting insulin should be done. So we know they're going to get a dose, but it'll be a less dose. Clear liquid diets are usually simple carbohydrates. Try to match insulin injections with peak times of blood glucose for simple carbs. Entero feedings also contain more simple carbohydrates, and insulin must be given at regular, regular intervals. 
You want to assess blood glucose levels frequently if tube feedings are discontinued. Make sure to plan to alter the insulin administration as well. Oral hygiene and skin care must be given special attention to in hospitalized diabetic patients. Careful assessments of the oral cavity as well as the skin must be made to ensure that and to prevent skin breakdown, right? Foot care should be continued to be performed daily as well as teeth brushing performed routinely a couple times a day. Stress, uh, stress contributes to hyperglycemia, both physiologic wise, uh, physiologic stress as well as psychological stress, right? Both can imp uh, increase and cause hyperglycemia. Oftentimes I had my hospitalized diabetic patient say to me, my blood sugar never gets this high at home. Well, they're saying my blood sugar never gets this high at home because they're under, their body's under physical stress from being sick. Their mind is under uh, mental stress from being in the hospital and not being at home and with everything that's going on with them, right? So we as the nurse need to take the time to educate them on how stress hormones affect blood glucose levels. And we also need to educate them on following the diabetic regimen as closely and, and as possible at all times to ensure that uh, we manage their blood glucose levels. We also need to help them learn how to cope with stress and teach them, you know, these coping strategies, right? Sometimes the elders have extra hurdles to cross in meeting the diabetic regimen, right? Because elderly patients have additional layers of education that need to occur, right? Maybe uh, these barriers include having vision or hearing losses, or maybe memory deficits or decreased mobility, right? Or de decreased fine motor coordination or increased tremors, or maybe the elderly patient has depression or social is isolation, or maybe they don't have uh, financial resources that they need for their di diabetes control. There are so, so many things that can come into play when you're trying to manage these patients, right? So we must assess for these all being present um, and ensure that we're approaching each, each situation clearly. You need to make sure you provide brief but frequent teaching sessions and acquire any adaptive equipment or special glucose monitors for the patient. Assess their ability to learn and retain the information Call on family members if needed to assist with uh, the treatment regimen and make any uh, community resource referrals available to them, the patient and the family. Most can do it if the most patients can do what they need to do to care for themselves at home. They just might need a little extra time for you to teach them that. OK, so you need to assess that they actually got it before we discharge them home. OK, that's it. This is the end of the lecture on diabetes.